Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. The corona contagion overshadows all other issues across the Middle East, as is the case globally. And while all other matters pertaining to the security situation in the Levant and beyond may have been marginalized in the public's consciousness, they continue to pose challenges to local and major actors alike. In today's program, we will discuss the situation in Israel's northern war to our neighbor, Syria, where misery started long before the global plague and is unfortunately expected to persist long after the coronavirus will have been subdued. Joining me in the studio to discuss this important topic is our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren. Shalom. And uh, due to the requirement of social distancing, joining us from central Israel, Dr. Eran Lerman, who is the vice president of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security and a lecturer at uh, the Shalem College. Welcome. And joining us all the way from Sao Paulo, Brazil, is Dr. Nir Bums, research fellow at the Moshe Dayan Center at Tel Aviv University. Good to have you with us, Neil. Good to be here. Uh, Mr. Oren, we'll uh, start with a question to you. Give us a broader understanding of the current situation uh, in uh, Syria, uh, namely also considering the fact that the situation remains tense between Turkey and Russia vis-a-vis uh, -vis the northwestern Idlib region. Well, Jonathan, indeed, the uh, uh, coronavirus crisis uh, seems to be not only the most uh, salient issue, the most uh, important one right now, but almost the only one. And uh, under uh, the uh, auspices um, of uh, such an issue, uh, one may say, uh, two well-respected officials uh, have uh, issued a call last week, that is Pope Francis, and uh, UN Secretary General uh, Gutierrez, calling on all world leaders uh, to cease all conflicts um, and uh, to impose a ceasefire on uh, the Syrian uh, conflict as well as other conflicts. Well, this is, of course, uh, well-meaning, but um, does not have a real chance of uh, uh, success because uh, in northern Syria, and especially in Idlib, uh, the uh, war is going on with several vectors. Uh, the um, Syrian regime of uh, Bashar Assad uh, wants to drive the uh, rebels either out or down and finish the war on its terms. Mm -hmm. And obviously, uh, the uh, Assad regime is being helped by the Russians. The Russians are bombing and shelling and helping uh, the uh, Syrian boots on the ground. Uh, there are the local forces, uh, which many people see as uh, jihadists or terrorists, um, and they are uh, fighting uh, Assad. Uh, but they are also uh, being helped, in a way, uh, even though uh, there may not be a direct connection, by the Turkish forces. Turkey, of course, Syria's northern neighbor, has a stake in what is happening uh, south of its border. And uh, uh, Turkey is uh, helping the anti-Assad forces. And some of uh, those forces, especially the so-called White Helmets, um, uh, are trying to portray Turkey as mostly a NATO member, mm -hmm. saying that uh, even though Turkey has been known uh, to uh, uh, seriously um, uh, impair uh, human rights earlier, Right now, it has, as they call, a NATO pedigree. And therefore, uh, it is uh, uh, more to be counted on than uh, Syria and Russia. So they are calling on the United States to help Turkey against Syria and Russia. Uh, turning to Dr. Lehrman in central Israel. Uh, Dr. Lehrman, to what degree do you see the current situation in Syria continuing uh, in the, the manner that it has in uh, the past several weeks? Uh, of course, uh, uh, there was the, the uh, Operation Spring Shield of Turkey, which uh, uh, culminated in uh, somewhat of a ceasefire arrangement between President uh, Vladimir Putin and his uh, Turkish counterpart, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Uh, nevertheless, it seems like uh, 
there is uh, still tension between the two countries, not only because of the Syrian front, but also very much because of the situation in Libya, where uh, Turkey continues to back the Saraj government in Tripoli, as opposed to Russia, which uh, uh, backs together with other regional allies, including uh, Egypt and also Israel, to a certain degree, behind uh, the scenes, uh, the Haftar government in eastern uh, Libya. Well, there seems there must be a limit to how many uh, balls Erdogan can keep in the air at the same time. Um, he tried, by the way, to hide the level of seriousness of the corona problem in Turkey, and that uh, has um, come to a, an end because we are, by now it's clear that there are thousands of cases in Turkey as well. Uh, meanwhile, it is no longer possible for Turkey and under the circumstances of the coronavirus crisis and as a direct result of it, it's no longer possible for Turkey to offload its uh, refugee issue, its uh, refugee crisis on its European neighbors, specifically on, on Greece, because this has met now with uh, pretty aggressive uh, resistance under, again, under the circumstances. Mm. <laughs> so the... Uh, the capacity of, of uh, the Turk, uh, Turkish government to engage in uh, almost uh, um, simultaneous conflict with uh, a, ho a whole range of, of neighbors and, and, and strategic players um, must come to some kind, uh, under some kind of limitation. Mm -hmm. Therefore, uh, if, uh, if I would uh, assess what is absolutely vital for Turkey and what is uh, of a lower priority, I would say that their capacity to pursue their interest in Libya uh, comes um, is, a, is secondary to their, the implications of their involvement in Syria. There, Indeed. they can more or less, since the, the future of Idlib has to do with a huge population that may be pushed over into Turkish controlled areas, uh, I believe that to the best of their ability, they will concentrate on sustaining some kind of working relationship with, with the Russians uh, in that area, some kind of a, um, a standoff, uh, perhaps utilizing the calls uh, for uh, um, a, a uh, virus-induced ceasefire, even if this means that they uh, th it comes at the cost of giving up on the ambitious plans, which uh, are not easy to implement, of helping the Siraj government, uh, the GNA, uh, uh, survive the ongoing uh, pressure from the LNA and the Haftar forces in Libya. If they have to prioritize, I think this is where they will uh, make their choices. Uh, turning to Sao Paulo, Dr. Uh, Neil Bombs, I would like to ask you vis-à-vis uh, -vis the, the current situation of the migrants, uh, specifically what also Dr. Uh, 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 Lerman spoke about vis-à-vis uh, -vis the, uh, the fact that at this stage uh, there is an ongoing uh, effort in Turkey to really uh, expand to different uh, areas uh, of interest. Uh, nevertheless, it seems like the, the whole migrant issue, some would say, uh, had to do specifically with the SOFIA mission, the European SOFIA, uh, Sofia mission, which was tasked with uh, ensuring first and foremost uh, uh, thwarting the, uh, the human trafficking from Libya and elsewhere uh, from Africa and Europe, uh, but also uh, not less uh, important than that, it's to uh, maintain an arms embargo on Libya, on the Saraj government, as well as the Haftar government at this stage, which Turkey, of course, is furious about as it wants to uh, deploy additional troops uh, to assist uh, the Haftar government, uh, the Saraj government, sorry, uh, in Libya, which, of course, uh, it seems like those two uh, conflicts now between uh, Turkey and the Assad regime in Syria, as well as the situation between Haftar and Saraj, uh, is intertwined to a big deal, which impacts directly also Europe. For sure. And, you know, we have said that uh, in this program in the past, and we can say this again, uh, politics remains politics, war remains wars, and people uh, who remain people often suffer from this. Uh, in the world today, we have... Uh, 
about 70 million refugees and displaced people, more than following the Second World War, the last decade, and the Syria war specifically, and then uh, the crisis in Iraq and Libya, in Africa, have contributed significantly to this. Uh, every second Syrian lost his or her home, and many of them ended up uh, in Turkey. Uh, the numbers around there, about 3.5. Uh, million, uh, and we have spoke about uh, the uh, different attempts to try to bring these refugees uh, to Europe as a part of a, a, a pressuring point uh, uh, regarding the Turkish-European relations, regarding the EU, and also uh, regarding uh, NATO. And the same uh, on the refugee piece uh, applies to, to Libya. And it's important to also note that uh, at the time when we are all dealing with coronavirus, when we're all reminded to wash our hands, uh, the number of people who do not have uh, uh, fresh water, not to mention masks or uh, or ability to keep social distancing, um, is something that uh, is very much applied to many of these uh, uh, refugees that's connected to the beginning of your question. Um, leaders tend to deal with politics, not necessarily to the political uh, price that the people will pay, and, and therefore uh, the struggles begin. In Yemen, we now see a, a, perhaps an attempt to use the corona uh, um, to uh, uh, create a, a, a degree of a ceasefire. Uh, we may see this uh, elsewhere, but uh, this is also a reminder that uh, we've seen t different attempts to create a cessation of uh, violence or ceasefires and agreements before. We've seen them violated as well. Uh, and part of the world coming back to normalcy, unfortunately, uh, means that uh, this will come back to normalcy again. These uh, struggles and these power struggles have not, uh, uh, not resolved by uh, coronavirus. Uh, Erdogan still have its uh, his ambitions, both uh, in Turkey. Uh, we've just seen another interesting move uh, by cutting some of the water supplies uh, from the Turkish held uh, areas inside Syria to the Kurdish uh, uh, towns. Uh, further uh, uh, to the uh, uh, east, um, and that's part of the Turkish uh, uh, tactics in that they are willing to use uh, different means uh, in order to continue to uh, pursue their objectives. That applies both uh, in uh, Syria uh, itself, but certainly applies in Libya too. Indeed. Uh, Mr. Ogan, I'd like to bring Israel into the picture. Of course, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran has been supporting the Assad regime uh, throughout the war. It uh, uh, entered this conflict uh, uh, it, about 2013-2012 uh, when uh, the Assad regime initially received advisors of how to deal with the social uprising in this country. And uh, quickly, uh, once the uh, uh, Ayatollah or the RGC provided uh, its advice, uh, things started to de uh, deteriorate rate and become a lot more violent. And I'd like to ask you on, on the current situation vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran, considering also the tough situation in Iran proper, uh, to what degree are the Iranians still actively aspiring to uh, establish that crescent uh, through Iraq, uh, Syria, into Lebanon, and from there into the Mediterranean, which would allow it to engulf Israel on the northern front, uh, and uh, to, of course, also transfer sophisticated weaponry uh, for the purpose of uh, elevating the capacity of precision-guided missiles on Israel's northern uh, front, but also to secure its interests which is very, uh, very much intertwined with the survival of the Assad regime. And to what degree is Israel now dealing with also the coronavirus, dealing with the Iranians, consider, uh, considering the fact that uh, it's still very clear about its red lines, where it will not allow uh, the Islamic Republic and its uh, uh, various branches, proxies, and, and uh, militant uh, groups which it supports to entrench themselves militarily on, on Israel's borderlines. Well, at the turn of the year, only uh, some three months ago, uh, various intelligence agencies and think tanks published mm -hmm. their annual threat assessment. And of course, none of them spoke about the virus, which uh, started at exactly uh, the, the same time to uh, spread around uh, the world. And uh, this, uh, of course, shows you not only the limits of mankind, in dealing uh, with such phenomena, but also the limits of intelligence uh, assessors. Now, before the virus, Israel saw the Iranian entrenchment in Syria as its number one enemy for this current year. But not right now, Israel um, has all of the threats and challenges on hold. It does not initiate any major uh, strike against uh, uh, its enemies unless uh, something is imminent 
and then it does uh, take uh, an aerial attack or a missile attack in order to thwart the uh, transport of uh, missiles or precision equipment. But the Israeli military uh, has to be ready to assume the responsibility for taking care of the country itself. When the Ministry of Defense accepts the responsibility, uh, the so-called passing of the baton, then the chief of staff of the Israeli armed forces becomes the commander in chief in the field. He has under him the uh, home front, the rear guard uh, command. But the chief of staff must divide uh, his attention between the fronts and the home front, which assumes top priority. Uh, all of that um, uh, means that Israel would rather, if it can um, uh, take care of the threats by standoff weaponry, it would rather do that because if it goes um, into maneuver warfare, for instance, in Lebanon or in Gaza, it would have to mess formations. Uh, right now, as we are speaking with our two colleagues here, uh, with the distance of uh, dozens of kilometers and even thousands of kilometers away, Israel would rather not send battalions, companies, or even platoons to, yeah. uh, to uh, undertake uh, operations in Gaza and Lebanon, which may infect soldiers. Not only is the enemy lethal, but so is the very messing of troops. So all of this uh, has to be taken under consideration. Uh, Dr. Lehrman, I would like to ask you with regard to this uh, analysis, uh, uh, because my mentor always taught me at times of cri a crisis, always uh, uh, execute your most ambitious endeavors. Uh, to what degree would you uh, consider different intelligence agencies or uh, different uh, uh, military arms of, of the various countries, including Israel for this case, using this uh, cloud called the coronavirus in order to execute its most uh, important strategic uh, uh, components. So uh, the day after this contagion is subdued, uh, they will maintain the upper hand. Well, um, it's not that easy to do in the midst of uh, dual or even triple crisis. There's a crisis, there's a, an ongoing political crisis in Israel which needs to be resolved. Uh, there is a profound medical crisis and there is an economic crisis which raise, raises huge, huge questions about what kind of resources are we going to have available to us to manage the situation, including uh, in terms of uh, what will happen to budgets, to military budgets. Um, and I would add that certain the, the level of uncertainty about the future of the United States, and the economy of the United States, and the relationship with an America which is going through a, an agonizing internal crisis uh, right now, all of these raise the level of uncertainty uh, for Israeli decision makers to unprecedented to an unprecedented degree. So it's not easy under these circumstances to take daring decisions in one in one or two more fronts. Um, uh, I think the logic is different right now. Iran is in a profound internal crisis. It is not just a question of the the virus, which is apparently out of control and, and, and we, uh, the statistics coming out of Iran seem to be very unreliable in terms of just how deep uh, the crisis is. There's also a profound economic impact uh, that would have happened if even if Iran was not under siege, but now it is. And, and right now we are hearing that uh, uh, China has suspended all, uh, all oil um, purchases from Iran. So the Iranian economy is going into a total tailspin, uh, which uh, leaves the regime very deeply exposed. Indeed. So this is a time for Israel perhaps to think about the, the uh, options that may be necessary if the Iranians decide to break all rules, but to keep them um, uh, sort of charged and locked and ready in case the Iranians make that decision, while also preparing for the possibility, just possibility uh, at this stage, that the magnitude of the crisis will force the Iranians to come back to the negotiating table on something which looks more like American terms. Uh, very tough. 
but uh, when the uh, uh, supreme leader of Iran speaks of uh, of uh, devils and and American conspiracies to hide uh, all kinds of uh, evil stuff, if the U.S. does send Iran some medication, I think he's whistling in the dark. The Iranian people would love to come over to for the United for the crisis to be over and for the United States to be uh, able to help them in their extreme, extremely dire situation. So the pressures are building up from within. And this is a time to prepare the daring options that you mentioned in case all of this fails, but also to be open to the possibility that the crisis will change the rules of the game. Indeed. Uh, Dr. Bombs, uh, I'd like to hear your take on this uh, specifically, as well as on the fact that uh, we've been seeing the Islamic Republic of Iran through its uh, uh, arm, the RGC and its Quds Force, uh, continuing to support the Houthi rebels in Yemen, where uh, ballistic missiles were fired from uh, that country into Saudi Arabia in order to harm its uh, economic and uh, oil-related platforms, as well as military installations. And at the same time, uh, uh, the Hashd al-Shabi in uh, Iraq continues uh, to fire rockets into the green zone uh, where uh, most international embassies are stationed in Baghdad and uh, also the government of Iraq, the central government of Iraq and other uh, strategic installations. To what degree do you see this contagion actually limiting the Islamic Republic from its activities also vis-a-vis -vis Syria? So first, uh, Jonathan, you started with the land bridge, and there's an interesting uh, anecdote there. But 2,500 years ago, under the uh, Ahmadite, Ahmadite uh, dynasty, uh, the, those who led the, the Farsi Empire 2,500 years ago, they were very well known, much before the Romans, in paving roads. And they've paved the road uh, all the way to uh, the Middle East, uh, and these are the same roads that were used and continuously used. Uh, in 1833, when one of the more recent influenza-plagued uh, pandemics hit the region, it hit Iran very hard, and the 1918 Spanish flu, 10% of the population of Shiraz uh, perished uh, in the Spanish flu because of these connections and these land bridges. If you're following now, if we're following now uh, on the uh, epidemic, uh, the current epidemic, the corona route that actually made Iran an epicenter, we realized that the same land bridge that Iran was very uh, 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 tirelessly uh, attempted to uh, uh, maintain uh, actually was the one who brought coronavirus from China to Iran and then from Iran to Iraq, uh, to Lebanon, to Syria, uh, through the proxies, through the militias, through the relationship with uh, Hezbollah. Uh, we hear now that uh, the leader of uh, uh, Hezbollah, uh, Shamasrallah, is also uh, under uh, quarantine, uh, they realized uh, Iran was smart enough, quote unquote, to continue the flights to China, uh, even at the height of the Corona crisis. Um, the, uh, of course, very little uh, equipment or ability uh, to deal with this. Uh, this same land bridge is really in many ways what brought uh, much of the demise uh, in, in the particular Corona circumstances uh, in Iran. And I think if you are flipping this picture for a second, and go to the populace of Iran. Uh, perhaps uh, for them, and I will continue what Dr. Lorenz has said, it's maybe a bit of a Chernobyl moment. You know, in, in the time of Chernobyl, when uh, the uh, Soviets uh, uh, officially insisted, well, you know, uh, we are, everything's under control, there is no crisis. And soon enough, the people realized how um, really useless their system is. We've had some moments like this in Iran, but I think what you hear in the streets of Iran like that is that the fact that uh, not only that we are spending all this money that we don't have on wars somewhere else, uh, when the, the only thing we are able to fight and, and shoot down is uh, Ukrainian airplanes, uh, and uh, we are able to continue the flights to China in order to bring the virus to us. So under economic sanctions, uh, global isolation, our, our government was smart enough to actually bring the virus to us, no ability to handle it, uh, and therefore, uh, and the pressure uh, continues. I'm not sure if that will bring, bring about a burst, uh, but certainly I think that the uh, Iranian regime finds itself in not a, a very good moment. Many of its uh, own uh, uh, officials uh, have found themselves uh, victims to the corona. Uh, some of them had uh, passed away, including some very senior uh, officials and the vice president. Uh, and all of that, I'm sure, slows them down, although uh, the revolution needs to continue.
Um, and that's why they continue, uh, at least what they try to continue in Yemen. And perhaps there is a reminder, uh, and the coronavirus can serve as a reminder, at least to some, uh, that there are things that are bigger than that. And for the sake of uh, the Iranian people, perhaps somebody needs to change route. Indeed. Well, we're drawing near to the end of the program, so I'd like to give each and every one of you the opportunity to have a closing statement. Please keep it short. Uh, Mr. Owen, we'll start with you. Uh, this is an election year, obviously, in the United States, both the president, uh, the entire House of Representatives, one-third of uh, uh, the Senate, uh, as well as in Russia. In Israel, the uh, crisis uh, has not been resolved yet politically. But uh, I would like to expand on something that Iran Lemon mentioned, that is the financial impact of the coronavirus crisis. After it is over, neither the United States, obviously any other country, nor any other country, will have money to invest in the reconstruction of Syria or in the Palestinian uh, part of the uh, so-called deal of the century. Well, uh, Dr. Lerman? Well, I would li like to uh, hope that despite uh, what we know about Washington being a one-issue town and everyone absorbed by the coronavirus, there would still be enough attention paid to stabilizing the region. A uh, uh, clear and effective American intervention in favor of a non not anti-Iranian or non-Iranian dominated government in Iraq and in favor of uh, curbing Turkish ambitions in the Mediterranean, both could have very important strategic results at a very limited cost right now and with a very positive effect mm -hmm. down the road. Dr. Bombs? I think that the uh, coronavirus that uh, put the whole world into a halt uh, may have an opportunity inside of it. It's a reminder for some people in the region that there are things that are bigger than uh, sectarian wars and radical ideologies. And there are things that are bigger because they can eventually go and hunt all of us. And perhaps after that we will see, uh, and I hope we will see, some rise uh, amongst the voices who say, look, enough with this. Uh, we need to uh, adjust to a different world. We need to work together uh, and we need to change course. Uh, and that certainly applies uh, into uh, the case of Iran. And this is all the time that we have for today. So I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Oren, Dr. Bombs, as well as Dr. Lerman. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well. And we will see you next time. You just watched TV7 Jerusalem Studio. We encourage you to pray for the challenges raised in today's program. If you were blessed by our production, please consider supporting TV7 Israel. The details of our respective bank accounts for donations from Europe and the United States appear on the screen. Your generosity allows us to continue to serve God's calling, to broadcast content that truly matters through TV7 Israel from Jerusalem.